Okay, moving on with more of my favorite movies and stuff, or, or movies, I should say, um, honorable mentions and different kinds of things. Uh, just FYI, I am quite tired. It is pretty late, but I figured that uh, the show must go on, so um, in spite of my tiredness. So the next thing I had on my list, I actually did already talk about this, but I, at some point the camera turned off, <laughs> so I have to do it over again. Um, but I was talking about Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, which is uh, actually I have right here. Um, somewhere, yeah. Here it is. Um, they... I can't remember the name. I feel bad. I can't remember the name of the director. Um, I mean, sorry. But, um, it was a Japanese director, but it's a really great movie. Um, that is, uh, has, uh, Ryuki Sakamoto also scores it and acts as the, um, lead, uh, one of the lead roles. Um, and there's just, uh, David Bowie, obviously has a really, um, I think some of his other roles are like The Man Who Fell to Earth, so he wasn't any, he was no stranger to the acting kind of world. Uh, and he did a pretty understated uh, kind of dramatic role in this. Um, he, without chewing the scenery, there wasn't a lot of this. Um, a lot of this kind of reminded me of the classic, right off the bat with, uh, you know, the kind of classic um, war film genre, but it actually goes further than that. Like the, I'd say I'd argue even further and more impactful and then say um, Bridge Over River Kwai or um, some other, uh, I think, uh, another bridge movie. <laughs> There's, I think it's uh, A Bridge Too Far. Yeah, that was actually one of my favorite movies when I was a kid. Um, just because I was like World War II obsessed kid that was obsessed with everything that was related to war and civil war and stuff like that, so, um, but then as I grew up, I began to kind of lean a little bit more towards, uh, not away from war movies, but, like, I began to, like, like things like, um, The Thin Red li Line, like, Terrence Malick, and I didn't understand why I liked it, but it was, like, because of, it was actually because it was an anti-war film at heart, like, a lot of Stanley Kubrick's movies or anytime he talks about war, a lot of the times, like, you know, Full Metal Jack is, like, a glaringly anti-war film. Um, and I feel the same way about Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, because it goes, you know, um, there's a lot of kind of like a pretty, um, subtle jab, jab at like Japanese imperialism, like the, this whole culture of like shame and like, you know, and taking it to your death, you know, like the whole thing of like seppuku and, um, I think, you know, like that, like to the, you know, like you're so... The idea of like kamikaze warfare, like the, the, that you're so very driven towards this ideal, like so you're so hell bent on fulfilling this like expectation of like what Japanese males are supposed to do and like how you're supposed to act and perform and like be like at your best like physical capacity to the point where any failure to do to do so would result in just total shame and castigation on social castigation, so, um, it would, it would be greater just to suffer your own death on that, so, um, not to try to, like, uh, cartoonize or kind of, uh, uh, not to, not to kind of poke fun at it, but it does, uh, you know, um, I guess humor, humor is a kind of coping me mechanism, but I did find, um, this movie kind of, um, well, it's not a funny movie, there are some lighthearted scenes as well, like, um, but yeah, uh, um, Buffalo '66 on here with Vincent Gallo. Um, I think it came out in 1998. Um, yeah, for, I have not seen any other Vincent Gallo. I've heard about like Brown Bunny, I think, and there's was there another one with Mickey Rourke, I think, um, who honestly made a, made a cameo in Buffalo '66. But I've actually not seen any of his other movies aside from this. I figured I'd start out with this because I was a little hesitant to watch Brown Bunny. I've heard, you know, very divisive things about it, like it being kind of uh, very graphic and, you know, and, uh, and like I said, like I'm not super adverse to watching, you know, like a movie that's like really, you know, like it just like barren, just strike, you know, showing like no, no holds bar, like what um, uncensored stuff. I'm, I'm not totally averse to that, but I also want to kind of pace myself and be like, well, you know, um, 
to never say never. I might watch it sometime in the future, but um, I did like uh, Buffalo 66 because um, the character of Bobby in this is just so, um, you know, it's, uh, he's somebody, I don't know if it was just somebody like commenting or somebody maybe on IMDb, um, had a pretty interesting opinion on the character, on his character in this movie of someone that you wanted to like kind of hug and comfort one second and like you just want to be there for them and the next second you want to like punch him in the face that kind of describes exactly how i feel about uh uh bobby in this movie he's just so on edge all the time and he's so he seems very like excruciatingly worried about like this the wrong things i believe um like he's you know he's trying to get impress his parents by you know basically hiring this, you know, not hiring, not hiring, but, you know, basically kidnapping this one girl, played by Christina Ricci in this, um, into, like, play acting as his, um, uh, girlfriend, you know, for the sake that his parents won't be, uh, you know, like, so, like, to kind of cover up the fact that he's been in jail for all these years, and that's, uh, I think it's a pretty compelling storyline on its own. Um, I'm not too sure to what extent Vincent Gallo you know, he identifies with the character. Uh, um, it, he does do some very troubling, questionable things, and there is a bit of a questioning kind of thing at the end when it's like he does, spoiler alert, he does, like, kind of get, you know, he wins over Layla's effect, you know, the, his, uh, Christine Ricci's reach, in this uh, affection near the end of the movie, and they kind of, like, do fall in love, and there's also, I feel like that's kind of a cop-out, and I feel um, just on a kind of guttural level that, like, their affection, her affection towards him was like a puppy dog kind of love. It was like a kind of like fly, it was a kind of, she had no clue what she was getting herself into. Whereas Bobby Brown, you know, he was like a total like loose cannon. One second he's like very, you know, kind of charismatic and he's like, you know, he's uh, just trying to, but like the next second he's just kind of, um, stubborn and just hard-willed and just like uh just fixated on like, totally just trying to prove you know th do the wrong things like he's like so fixated on i don't know too much about sports but like it does play a big pivotal role in the movie in the sunset like the you know buffalo brown like that's basically what he's named after is like a very sports like kind of thing and that's like a, you know where he comes from in new york and all these different the new york nests of this movie really comes out i'm not you know i being like seven or eight hours from new york it is kind of hard for me to kind of identify with that because you know it's not often i go there and it is it's kind of a special occasion um but i do kind of understand you know uh quite the the, the legend uh that new york has garnered um uh especially with its different factions and different things like harlem and you know uh the, the you know like uh hell's kitchen and you know like uh down, uh, you know, like, Greenwich, Greenwich Village, and basically how they all play, and, like, there's, you know, like, they're basically, like, to me, it's, like, it seems a bit silly, because these places are, like, literally just, like, miles apart, um, but to these, you know, when you go down to the metrop metropol metropolitan level, it really makes all the difference, because it's, like, everything's so cloistered together, so, um, anyway, so next, train spotting I put on here, just because I've, meaning to watch it for quite some time to my great shame i've literally only just watched it like a week ago about um and yeah I, I again when i say like i'm not saying it's not i'm not necessarily saying it's on my ooh, it's one of my favorite movies ever i just saw something very culturally impactful about it like very um just check to see if this is recording and yes we are okay um, so I just saw something very interesting with the way it's constructed. It, you know, it's, it's not trying to, it's not coming from a bad place of trying to, like, shame heroin users or uh, addicts in general. Um, but it's also not trying to glamorize it too much. It's showing, like, the very, like, n naked, bare, <laughs> naked aspect of heroin use and how harrowing, no pun intended, um, it can be. Like how it just destroys, it ruins completely just, um, unravels your life, you know, like this, it's, 
I think this is probably like a more effective PSA against drugs like this and maybe Rec Room for a Dream um, than some of these uh, corny kind of PSAs you see a lot a lot of the time in schools and you know like they just saying like it's cool just say no just being you know that's the whole thing it's lampooning is just say no the whole thing or just say yes say yes to life say you know um choose life that's what it was yeah choose life choose a nice house in the suburbs all that like i think that's a pretty iconic opening scene i think that's up there with like fight club and um a lot of like 90s movies like that's why i wanted to watch it for so long because i heard it's like a very um stands on its own terms definitely but i it also was a part of a cultural wave i think i think irvin walsh who and the novel i've actually finished um did such a good job on um on i think what it was was this, the post um punk i think scene it's it had somebody described it as like the book as having um like the sensibility of like um punk but like also of in a, coming from a smarter more deeper level like it's like not it's i think punk a lot of the times it's like very reactionary i think i don't know too much about it but stuff with like sex pistols and stuff like that it's coming from more of a instinctual kind of like yeah just react to the, the times and how bad and there's and maybe there's a philosophy to be something to be said about um the i guess immediacy of it like there's a lot of pent-up rage and like the way things are um uneasiness that everybody can kind of see that's why a lot of the times you you feel there's like a cultural kind of connection going on like a collective unconscious i guess with let's say like um not only punk but stuff like grunge too like there's like something about the 90s at the early 90s especially with like nirvana you know or like post or like different you know grunge uh, bands that were like maybe not so um, on the nose with their kind of you know message <laughs> like um, something you could like maybe dance to more like um, something like Pearl Jam or like um, but I think a lot of this stuff like uh, what it's getting at is like a lot of like what happens like the subculture is like begins to kind of like um, analyze and critique the culture so much and it becomes so in vogue that th that the thing that you become, you know, it's like David Foster Wallace was saying, like the thing that you become, you've critiqued actually, you are now, so you become the thing. So everybody's, you know, um, kind of in on it, and it kind of like ruins the pastille, not um, the uh, not necessarily the appeal. Well, maybe that, but anyway. So train spotting, yeah. Uh, the only thing I'd say is a little bit too. It felt like it dwelled in the murky aspect a little bit. Um, for me, both the movie and the film, um, even though it differed in the film being, rather than having... The, uh, the novel was more or less almost like a series of short stories, um, not to uh, undercut it by any rate, because it's like still pretty cohesive and thorough, but you almost had to tell from stories like of people other than Mark Renton or Rent Boy. He had to, you also had to kind of... Well, it's also from the point of view of um, Sick Boy and uh, Spud, and I think, and um, I don't know if it's Begbie. Um, these other cast of characters are very quite um, realistic kind of pastiche representations of what Irving and Walsh probably interacted with in Scotland. And, you know, um, but I felt like there was a little bit too much self-loathing, maybe. Like, a little bit too much of the, we're just nothing but, you know, Scotland's nothing but a bunch of fat assholes. We're, like, we're... we're Something like he said in the movie, like, um, we're colonized by a bunch of fet assholes. Like, we can't even be colonized by anybody interesting or something like that. So I felt like it was, like, everything's, like, very clever. But I feel like, and, um, sure, there's a lot of, like, relatability to it. But I feel like maybe there's, my, I'm coming from a point of view of, like, when I want to see a story or hear a story, like, I'm drawn into the hook of, there being uh, multiple different points of view showing that there's yeah sure there's a part there's a definitely an ugly dire uh dread inducing angsty part of everybody and i think that's very important to like, include in any story um if you're going to be completely honest um but i also think that there's other parts aspects of the human condition 
like uh, laughter or um, humor uh, to f be a deadpan or just kind of like out, out there kind of zany uh, expressive laughter of like you know of uh, affirming life you know like one second you're defying life so I wanted to show like every throw and iteration of the human condition through different things maybe I'm asking way too much but <laughs> asking me like that because you only get those type of novels like maybe Ulysses, Ulysses James Joyce or uh, something by Dostoevsky or you don't get all those types of novels every once in a plenty of learning Don Quixote but you don't get those type that kind of uh manifestation of creativity i feel like sometimes you get people that uh, oftentimes more often than not you get people who are a little bit too parochial not parochial but like they're a little bit too circuitous in their way like they're just like this is the way reality is and it's like they can't get out of this which is in lieu not which might actually be emblematic of kind of hey i'm actually poking fun of myself too which i like you know which i'm fine with like a woody allen but i'm actually not i actually on a kind of aesthetic level i actually think woody out's pretty good at what he does you know despite all the in spite of all the hideous allegations of like his personality and all those things obviously like those things probably show up in his work too to be honest i actually have given up on trying to even that's why i don't even have a woody out movie i said yes yes i know annie hall i did watch annie hall a while back it was okay. It was just okay. It was mediocre, honestly. I don't really, I don't really find Woody Allen all that compelling. He has some ups and downs, and he's like, ooh, every, he's like a broken clock is right twice a day, I guess. It's like kind of like that. He's just sometimes Woody Allen accidentally says something like a funny joke, and it would be, make me laugh or a little bit. It would be like a, <laughs> a, a faint chuckle, but um, more than that, I, I just, I'm sorry. It's, it's a, it might be a vibes thing. A lot of this. That's why. Don't take anything I take for exactly as like I'm, as if I'm some, I am not a trained critic here. I'm okay, continuing. Um, another mention is, I might as well get this on my chest. Uh, Wes Anderson movie. Um, there's, I don't really like his, his I don't. I'm not like a huge fan of his shtick, but I do like um, Rushmore. Was really great. I did uh, like Jason Schwartzman, his kind of um, tone throughout that movie. I thought it was really kind of uh, like funny, but also kind of in a relentless kind of way, where he's just like just wouldn't give up. You know, trying to prove his point of like trying to do all these things and tackle academic activities and. But or extracurricular activities, but like also failing grades, I think was the joke, um, and also just having like this unrequited kind of love interest type of thing going on uh, with one of the teachers and um, Bill Murray. Even though like I think Bill Murray kind of he, he's almost regarded kind of as like a um, I think people kind of like do a weird thing with him, like where they kind of like ooh the mythos of Bill Murray, ooh, like Bill Murray. Um, you know he's he's such like a cool guy he's like one of the, he's one of us you know he's he's like a type of guy that bar you know he goes to a bar and he uh bartends and he takes over a shift or something really, you know or something like um which i have nothing against like i guess you know he's such a cool guy but i just don't really um i don't know i just don't really i i don't i don't really like the whole you know uh kind of like the lore and kind of you know deification of bill murray I, i'd say like i think he's a pretty really good uh i think he has a good amount of talent i think he's has some insights into kind of you know the creative the field of you know acting and you know going beyond that and also being hungering you know not just to just do what you know whatever project hollywood has for him but also just you know actually so um yeah like i think that you know good for him but i just uh yeah but anyway that aside um i did like this movie um, but at the same time, um, there's also other Wes Anderson things that I'm just hesitant to get into, because, um, I mean, the Grand Buda Budapest Hotel was, again, like, just aesthetic-wise, framing-wise, the, the, just the, the world-building in it, like, just, like, the detach, you know, the separate kind of, um, non-linear kind of, <laughs> but also hearkening, but also kind of referencing to a like a point in like the 19 say 
1910s or 1930s, what was it, 1920s, 1910s or some, you know, because it's loosely based off a book, I think, that was like, you know, kind of, um, it's like experience in Turkey or was it Hungary or yeah, something like that, where it's like, um, you know, this um, thing with uh, just kind of this uh, Eastern European kind of feel of like, uh, or like kind of uh, that kind of impressionistic, uh, or is it expressionistic kind of thing, like kind of minimalist set piece, but also kind of like the whole expansive, commodious hotel itself. Um, to also kind of like the creative use of like animation and stop motion for different for different aspects of the movie. Um, yeah, I mean Ray Ray Fiennes as usual, just, just like great job. Um, yeah. Um, speaking of Ray Fiennes, he also was in um, Luca Guadagnino's movie, A Bigger Splash, which was really like. I don't think I've seen anything else by him yet. I was gonna see like the Lost trilogy at least, like Call Me Call Me by Your Name. Then there's one other, I think. I can't remember, but um, yeah, I did like a bigger splash though. Another television, uh, the way she's able to communicate so much without actually, because she's, uh, I think she's mute throughout most of the movie. Um, maybe the whole thing, I'm not sure, but like she's able to commute because she's like mute because she's like you know a singer, her character. Uh, so she's, I think she overexerts herself, I think, or sings the wrong way, so she's like not able to use her voice. But I thought that was pretty. Interesting. Um, talented Mr. Ripley. Um, was it was that 1999? Um, directed by um, Miguel, Max Anthony Miguel. Um, Miguel. Um, he passed away sometime. Not all that. Maybe it might have, might have been in like the early 2000s feel bad because I think I looked this up not too long ago. Should remember. Um, but yeah, I, uh, it comes from Mr. Ripley, so it's almost like a cartoonish movie in a sense that there's so many you identify, obviously. Um, I did do a book review of the Patricia Highness Smith novel, but I did really like this um, aspect of um, kind of like over the topness of uh, the characters and how I think how um, they kind of like. Um, expressed it in like kind of like a, in this very dramatic kind of histrionic way almost with you know Jew laws just got so like he's like oh don't you just want to do it? everywhere like there's something about Armani suits and tuxedos and like the best teams is like so like has such a zest for life um but it's all kind of like almost like an empty kind of way he has a way about him and he's like there's not really much to him and um, and then, you know, Thomas Ripley is just, like, so desperate, you know, Matt Damon has, pl plays it pretty well, you know, um, because I think Good Will Hunting, I, he was, that dramatic performance, I think, was a little on the nose, probably because it was, like, I think he was trying too much the insertion of, you know, kind of like, ooh, the writer, writer's, you know, auteur theory, basically, I think holds true, um, so, I think a lot, so, I mean, even though Gus Van Sand, who's, like, great, you know, independent, both that and also, like, big budget movie, he's able to kind of prove that, um, the stylistic director kind of thing, that he's able to maintain that with stuff like Good Will Hunting, but he's also, um, uh, Matt Damon and, you know, Ben Affleck's kind of, uh, you know, like, you know, like a young guy kind of syndrome, maybe he kind of fell through on that a little bit too much, but I still have a soft spot for it because of Robin Williams' uh, performance, and that was just phenomenal. And um, oddly enough, it's a weird thing with people like that because it's like I actually find Robin Williams' uh, dramatic performances a lot more interesting than his comedic performances. Probably because I'm not a big fan of comedy in general, like as a form of like stand-up comedy. Like I'm not into that at all. I just don't like it. I don't enjoy it. I don't find it all that engaging. I'm not able to keep my interest a lot of the time. I'm just like, okay, if anybody has an hour-long stand-up special, and the less it's something unique and kind of innovative, like Bo Burnham stuff, or like, um, or like stuff that's like not quite comedy, but like kind of musical comedy, like Flight of the Concords, who, is, who never failed to make something hilarious. Um, but I find. Um, comedians that are like, you know, 
really stereotypically zany and out there and, you know, um, big in the impression type of thing where they're like, you know, like, um, they, they bask in impressions like Dana Carvey and stuff like that. I feel like their stuff, or Jim Carrey, for example, is a lot better example, um, is able to actually pull off a, a dramatic performance much better than he is a comedic performance, I think. You know, like Man on the Moon, I thought was just, some of it was unbearable, I think. It was just like too much, way too much on the nose. Anyway, but there's a whole thing people did on the whole Jim Carrey's method acting on that, you know, how disastrous it was, but I'm not gonna get into that right now, because plenty of other people look at that, so. Um, this means... Truman Show. Speaking of that, The Truman Show is a good one too. Peter Weir, um, even though it is one of those movies like Shawshank Redemption that's like on the thing, I, on the, I do remember genuinely growing up in uh, Truman Show is one of those things that, was, that would be on kind of on a cycle semi thing. Um, I mean, I don't have access, I don't watch TV like, you know, cable television anymore. It's been years and years since I've regularly watched it at least. But I think, um, you know, every, most everything I watch nowadays is kind of just on my computer screen, or it's on, or on just, uh, you know, the, whatever t television so that's closest to me that has a DVD player, but I don't really watch, you know, cable TV, but when I did, Truman Show would be on, and, you know, though I didn't quite understand the whole kind of imp the fullest implications of the plot, you know, how, you know, he was being, like, you know, watched and ogled since he was a kid. Um, you know, like, in, into this world where he's, like, you know, thinks something's off, like, you could tell kind of intuitively. Um, you know, I did, I did really like, um, that more than Forrest Gump. I felt like Forrest Gump was always too sentimental and maudlin. Um, even as a kid, I think, would be like, you know, you'd, like, watch it once or twice, and I'd be like, okay, I'm, I'm done with it. Um, not a big Robert Zemeckis fan. Um... Not to say he can't grow as director, you know, going from making something like this weird, uh, garish thing called two, was it used cars or something with Russell, Russell, who is it? Kurt Russell, with him, is this the, um, but yeah, I think, um, speaking of that, it kind of reminded me a little bit of like UHF, I think, UHC or whatever with Weird Al, that's a really, <laughs> that's like a gold mine because I think it, it um, it has so many memeable kind of things, you know, um, that, uh, it has, uh, Michael Richards too with him and I didn't, I was never really, I found Seinfeld, him and Seinfeld to be that funny, but like, I think like it, the way he played that character of the janitor in, uh, UHF, is it UHC or I can't, UHF, I think, yeah, UHF, um, but like the whole aspect of public TV and the, what his, uh, weird, I was, character in that just you know so um so out there and um hilarious but um anyway moving on stuff like darren brown and stuff too like his like specials that he's had um stuff that there's one i think it's called can't quite remember but like it was like one about like stealing like a very um an art piece like a very esteemed prestigious art piece i think and there's other ones where short um, what i don't know if it was a full thing but it was like a thing where it's like he was get got a kind of a sleeper cell kind of guy to like program him hypnotize hypnotize him to kind of shoot to take out stephen fry you know to um you know obviously mock with mock bullets and you know he like to like say like a safe word or he, he gave him like a key word i guess to like tease him out of his sleep and, you know, to, for him to shoot, you know, the target, and it was pretty crazy. Some of it's, like, it, it all takes place, and it's, like, the stuff, like, rushing with the lead, or stuff that's, like, it almost seems, like, a little bit too dramatic and high stakes that you're, like, is this really happening, or is this, like, kind of, like, a, you know, like, you start to question what's real, what's not, or what's exaggerated through, you know, the, the lens of the, the camera, um, but he did do a really good thing with, like, the, um, um, hypnotizing a young guy into thinking that the world, not, well, not just hypnotizing, but he also u utilizing his, uh, surroundings and, like, you know, camera crews and, like, his budget to be able to, um, f 
finance and to like make like a set of like to make it seem like the world was ending it was called the apocalypse i believe uh, darren brown um and he basically got like this uh uh young guy like in his early 20s maybe late teens kind of slacker kind of not really a lot of potential not um not like a horrible person not like a, just like not, not like a juvenile delinquent but he was just kind of like you know he didn't show like respect for his parents didn't really show uh you know he didn't really show a lot of aptitude or care for like you know um for his like work or anything like that he just you know or he, like i don't think he really worked at all so he was trying to kind of tease potential out of this guy by um the classic kind of um negative visualization kind of stoic kind of thing like to imagine what it would be like if the world was ending and like everything was high stakes and he like <laughs> so the thought was like great the way he pulled it off so um uh so like must have been crazy trying to pull, pull that off like the way they did but like everything was like seemed to be like on you know playing down to the t of like trying to get him to you know, go to get, get him on the bus at the right time to kind of get him hypnotized and to make him seem like he was about to go to like a field trip i think or to go to some trip or whatever and then some transitional point and to get him out of the bus and then to have somebody like you know kind of expert positive like what was going on and like you know like it's like a turn off those nuclear war and to kind of also plant information too like this was great plant information in his phone too like to make all these news stories about like there might be a collateral war or something some, something with nato's might be happening or something you know? so that was pretty crazy um and like how he grew as a person through all all this too like he showed that a lot of people thought it was actually he talked about this in his book happy too which is really a guide to being i think to happiness i think um which is really a pretty good book um i might review it sometime um but he talks about how a lot of people were trying to work saying that it was fake i think and it was like and he was like saying that yeah he got the actual kid and talked to him and you know he brought him up again to like ask like where he was going in his life and it wasn't like a thing where it's like a traumatic kind of tony robbins thing where it's like i got off crack or i got off hard drugs or i you know my you know i'm and now i'm you know i it's like it wasn't like one of those turnarounds but he, he definitely he genuinely did seem to um grow as a person and to kind of be um like he was i think he was like volunteering his time and you know being a more generous and person he he was taking the necessary po you know m positive steps towards becoming a, a better person well-rounded um so i did show that you know like obviously it's not like a kind of a messianic thing and I'm not saying darren brown's flawless but i do think like the he has uh got some pretty um compelling th you know the ideas and kind of like like the way he kind of also kind of tries to point out the hypocrisy and that kind of like how people are also using it for grifting as well like he's trying to point out like yeah well um sure like he's making maybe a good pretty penny uh and he's you know he's talked about this too and he's like saying like but also there's been other people too using acting as if what they're doing is true magic like you know david copperfield may might be doing that or um yuri jeller is a famous example like just kind of the whole spoon bending type of trick where it's like a, it's a very catered it's very you know like there's a lot of cold reading too where he talks about like saying things it's like well you, do you feel like you're um feeling an energy passing through you or you're feeling like do you feel like maybe you're going through a depression like you lost someone in your life right that's cold that's very suspicious because those are things that could apply you know it's like the foyer effect like or the barnum principle i think using a vague description that could more or less apply to like a huge net of people and basically acting like that is um applying to the the person like that's like you're talking to them like on an, like you're on an, uh you're like a tele you know um a lot of a lot of mediums and stuff like you know the whole the medium of like tyler whatever his name is the hollywood medium that kind of tells us to um i don't i've only seen like a couple things that he's done but it's like this thing of like I, i'm sensing that you have a loss in your life and you know you that you're experiencing sadness or grief or that um and they're trying to communicate with you is that true they're trying do they do they do they used to call you did they used to call you by i want to say like they used to call you like my bunny rabbit is that true and what they're doing is like it's not magic it's not 
it's sure they they might be good at reading people that's good or you know whatever but it's not sheer magic and and that's why i like respect darren brown because he's like actually going the extra mile to kind of prove that how bonkers a lot of these people are like it, or you know the, the charismatic preachers movement too like trying to the way they use cold reading for perfidious gains as well to just kind of get people to kind of you know for people to you know he did this in the uh i think it was called the I can't remember. It was like it was like the the one guy he got to like call to be a preacher. It was like a scuba diving instructor. It was really really great. But um, you know he was pointing out like how so many preachers and so many prosperity gospel type of people like they tell people they basically you know are encouraging old people to like give up their medicine too. Like some of these people to like give up going to the doctors in favor of getting faith healed. Yeah, faith healers. That's what it was called. Um, and it's just disgusting because it's like you're you don't know like what these people they could suffer from a serious illness and they're giving up they're putting all their faith in sketchy to say the least totally grifty racketeering frauds that have no medical background no but it's big but because they're in, under the church and they're they think that they in their spellbound by these religious ideology to the point where they're seduced into not taking anything else or not seeing any other possibilities so that's kind of a lot of them are desperate well you know a lot so so at some point i was supposed to talk about how movies that i have some issue liking or watching um but i've de derailed it and started just talking about movies and shows and stuff that i actually do like um but uh let me try to get back to what i was starting to talk about was the holy mountain by uh alejandro jodorowsky um came out in like i think the early 70s 72 and i do genuinely like like the set design the acting uh, especially like the Christ figure kind of, you know, coming with the cross and, you know, the, the imagery of him with the cross and, you know, all these different people parading around him, and, um, like the eclectic, uh, mania of it all. And, you know, like that one weird room with like the alchemist and, you know, he's, uh, you know, like the, the white padded, not white padded, but, you know, it's like the barble white room with like his, uh, you know, masked woman and <laughs> like, that's all iconic. That's iconic cinematography and imagery uh but i th think the only thing i thought was just it was a little bit too like it did have acts and like a different um distinct you know, episodic parts you know the movie that flowed in its own unique way but i think it left me wanting in the sense that it was not i'm not having trouble with the kind of you know nudity or the the garish not garish, uh, stark nudity, I guess. Um, but, you know, like the, even if it's trying to point out, you know, the hypocrisy and like the, of like all those people that I shared, like, you know, in the second act of the movie, I think, you know, all the, the different frauds and people and, you know, the most, like the, you know, like the lustful and the, you know, the greedy and the, you know, all these different people. Um, but I felt like it was a little bit too surreal. I think surreal, maybe as far as it comes down to a, um, it goes down to a subjective kind of, uh, like, uh, affinity or dislike of something. I can't really describe why I do, I don't quite like some serial or some aspects of surrealism, what it stands for, I guess, like kind of just making things, it's just like things that are happening are just weird and offbeat, but we're not going to tell you why we're not going to tell you we're not going to give you um anything to counter that like it's just all of this is going to be taking place in just kind of the um primordial primordial oozy kind of dream like state like the like the original like the initial kind of um high of it and i feel like there's a little bit too much of that like um psychedelic kind of thing not to knock psychedelics but not that I'm a Puritan, that's gonna be like, oh, I mean, um, 
different videos might say my own uh i might talk about my own experience with psychedelics too um both negative and very very positive stuff but uh i just think like a little bit too much of it stems too much in that hippie-ish kind of like i'm not sure what yodorowsky was trying to say exactly about religion but he was like saying oh these people are bad there's they're too lustful or whatever through like the eyes of the alchemist kind of you know the alchemist id guy or not id but you know super ego maybe he was saying like these things are you know like the ethical in this and that but where's jodorowsky coming from morally to say this um like you see i don't know what his framework is but maybe i'm asking you too much it's a movie i mean i don't know but it's just that's my take on it i uh like it and i would rewatch it i just have some issues with like um the like the medium i'm uh, not the medium but like the surrealism itself as a, as an art form so <laughs> Slacker, Richard Linklater is a really great one. That he did this really, um, but Slacker first. Let me just um, it's the, it gives me hope to uh, like indie people that do it by DIY kind of thing. You know, people who don't have a lot of money at their disposal, but you know they just they really want to get you know they really want to have something to say to the camera. Uh, like this, like you going around kind of all the. You know, like, this show's kind of the, the, almost like a bohemian type of thing with uh, his hometown of Austin, Texas, and how, I think it's his home. Um, uh, but, yeah, like, how, um, how the, all the kind of oddballs around there that are, you know, going off in these whole things about, you know, Kennedy, um, you know, like, the, ass the famous assassination, and, uh, you know, like, the... Um, you know, like, just going on and on about the conspiracies about it, like, the uh, eccentric individuals like the anarchist guy like going on and on about how <laughs> you know when some guy tries to go in to kill him rob him he's like yeah let me tell you about anarchy and he just tells him hey and he, the guy doesn't even kill him he's just like oh well, you can kill me if you want but what are you gonna prove and <laughs> something like that it was just, i just thought that was funny um but yeah it's just in the dreamlike state too that kind of reminded me a lot of what was to come in waking life which is another great movie uh probably a favorite of mine um I don't know if I include that in the top 10, but I did talk about the before trilogy as being kind of all holistically a part of my top 10 favorite movies ever. Um, but yeah, um, that kind of, that um, feeling of like not really being awake or, you know, asleep or at the same time. Um, but, you know, like that first scene with Richard Linklater himself, because he was like, some people say like, oh, well, it's just like Martin Scorsese with um taxi driver showing himself in the you know backseat of car you know talking you know inserting his self in the narrative but at the same time i don't think it's quite that because blink later did try to get somebody else to play in the scene but they weren't available and he just felt like well i wrote it i can at least you know i can at least uh deliver the lines of the way that i think that it can so it's like for that i give him some, some respect i mean cut him some slack i mean there was a uh, some you know, like the whole thing about him you know like uh having a dream about all these different things and the, to uh, the cab drivers and i just thought it was really slightly amusing slash creepy kind of but um yeah definitely gonna see more of his stuff he did a really good movie called tape um which he didn't write um which i always say because he's kind of famously almost like an art, again at that art, auteur film theory of like you know uh being he's behind pretty much you know a lot of you know, script writing screenwriting as for his films but he does um it was actually somebody else who wrote it i think adapted it from a play i think and it really does work as a play because you know again it has ethan hawk uh robert sean leonard i think i mentioned him uh in dead poet society but he did a really great phenomenal they both did along with uma thurman did a really great job of like the min minimalist kind of thing you know with like you know it was filmed on tape too it was like a really ch kind of a cheap a uh, stage drama like you could uh, you could almost have a stage drama and uh and it would work out you know like somehow um i'd imagine i don't know if they did that already but it would be pretty cool if i did um anyway uh but yeah did, i like how this movie it has this kind of uh up uh upbeat um, but you can kind of feel bad for Salieri at times because the way, like, he's just, he, he just wishes so, like, he's done every, he's done the correct thing, he's followed the right path, he's been educated, he's been 
you know, he's he's committed his music to God, the glory of God, um, which is, you know, especially sacred, sacrosanct in those times. Um, <laughs> even during the Enlightenment, I think, too, is like, you know, uh, the hierarchy and, you know, God is still very much intact, I think, and, you know, at least for Salieri's family. And he was, you know, he thought he did everything right. And yet, here comes Mozart, you know, with like 10, you know, times more of the talent, um, you know, just effortlessly so, and he doesn't do any of the things, he doesn't do it, you know, he doesn't commit it to God, he doesn't do it, he's, he's not right, he doesn't act, you know, he's this body, raunchy, um, you know, like almost childish in a way, uh, you know, the way he's like, the way he talks, the way he's, you know, and the way he laughs too, like the way he dresses so flamboyant, um, and yeah, that is, I think the movie gets to invest in Salieri, it's not like, a, again, it's not like a good versus evil, like Mozart bad, he good, but it's in a way where it's like, maybe in some, if you were to measure morality in some like, you know, very black and white kind of fundamentalist, uh, I guess, dogmatist way, you would probably say, well, oh, Salieri is in the right, because he's, you know, committing himself to the right thing, his head's in the right place, whereas Mozart is in the wrong, but Mozart doesn't really see that, he just kind of acts on his own accord and doesn't really, you know, he's not trying to be offensive, he just kind of naturally is, you know, inclined towards being offensive, and that, you know, that kind of freedom, I guess, of the free spiritedness kind of gives him free reign to kind of do what he wants creatively, and, you know, to make all these kind of, uh, uh, just, what's the word, provocative kind of operas, and, you know, um, but yeah, um, that's all I have to say about that, surprisingly, <laughs> But, yes. Second thought. There's also a really great movie called 25th Hour by, directed by Spike Lee, um, not Spike Jones. Um, I have to keep correcting myself. Starring Edward Norton, um, Philip Seymour Hoffman, I believe, I can't remember. Is it Barry Pepper? Isn't it? Um, Anna Paquin, too. Uh, and it's quite a difficult kind of movie to describe because it's like... I kind of wanted to think it was like a, li a little bit like American History X to the point where I almost thought it was like by the same director, but um, not just because they both have Ed Norton in it, but um, I felt like the themes were very... a little bit... Like I, I was thinking of something like a white supremacist in American History X, Derek Vineyard, I believe. You know he, that kind of Ed uh, Norton plays in such a way that's like very. Uh, he almost seems so far gone and so radical that you don't think there's almost like no hope for him, and then like you know all of a sudden there's something just tragic happens in his life. Um, this is you know like being sent to jail and he like reforms himself and he like learns that. Hey, it's like, you know, it's like, uh, black people are just the same as anybody else, you know, like, they're just as, um, like, working alongside them and, uh, being forced to kind of, um, stop being so, like, haughty and above them and, you know, he's, he's forced to kind of actually work, live, and, uh, carry on, uh, you know, and even to the point of, like, actually, uh, respecting and uh, learning and, like, coming fully around and, uh, you know, coming out of his bigotry. Um, shows that there's like hope and reform reformation, uh, you know, which you like, um, but the one thing with like, um, American History X is that it's coming from the point of view of somebody who's not necessarily white supremacist, at least not in name, at least, uh, it, uh, on one side of it, like he's, he does shows, harbor some like bigot, definitely some bigotry. Um, he's, he's a kind of a sle sleazy drug dealer and he's, being sent to jail, and that's where 25th hour, because he's like, he's, um, basically has 24 hours before he, uh, you know, from b between the time he's, uh, convicted and apprehended and, um, by police, and they, you know, they get a warrant for, to search his place, um, and, oh yeah, his, uh, also starring, um, darn it, what was her name, something, not, something, something Washington, I think, uh, plays Natural, I think, um, can't remember. I'm blanking, sorry. Um, uh, but yeah, it, 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 25th hour being the final hour before he's sent to jail for seven years, I believe. Um, and basically, um, 
the whole movie is like it's almost like a heightened kind of thing it's like a very it's like that's like a it's like stereo it's almost like even though it's 2002 and there's a lot of kind of references kind of novel references to 9-11 um especially with new it being new york uh i felt like it was like also something that could have been released in like 1998, I think. And that's uh, coming as both as like a a bit of a negativity and a, and a positive thing at the same time. Like because um, it felt like a little bit dated, say, in like how very like kind of dramatic it was. And it was very like almost like stage production kind of level. Um, it felt like almost like a little bit on the nose in that sense. But I also felt like it was very great um, showing how uh, you know, with the rant scene, it's like, you know, people would, uh, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, <laughs> like, screw the city, F the city and everybody in it, like, may a, you know, a, uh, like, this a, like, the sewers and the rats, maybe it burned to the ground, may everything wipe it away, I think he was just, like, venting everything out, uh, at, at like, a uh, Monty Bergen, I think, um, yeah, that, that whole thing was just, like, it was, um, something that you feel like you could identify with certain aspects of, his rant like a little bit like you're like whenever you're angry you're like angry at people being pretentious or like certain people like groups of people that you see that act a certain way or um that are different very different than you and they're just like like why are they so like why do they act this way like why do they um put on why do they put on this certain facade or whatever and it's like um it's almost like satisfying in a way but like on the other hand it's like he's very hypocritical and he's projecting a lot of his own self-hatred because he, he she actually says at the end of him, he's like f you monty montgomery and broken because you had you had it all and you and you ruined it and like you dumb f you know like that's like kind of what the pinnacle of, like, that's the point of his rant was to show how everything was um like he basically screwed his whole entire life over because he was like an idiot you know he um he was um yeah and that's, you know, like, he, and no amount of, like, kind of just, like, constantly just, like, projecting his shame and hatred, self-loathing onto other people would actually, actually exonerate him of any of that. So, that's what I thought was kind of cool about his character, the dimensions of that, um, self-awareness. So, and then there's a lot of the, um, kind of the, um, because it's based off a book, too, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the author, but it's like similar. Like uh, Edward Norton does a really good job of directing a recent movie, semi-recent movie that I actually saw when it came out because um, I was actually pumped up to be like, yes, it's like finally coming out. Um, it's uh, Motherless Brooklyn, which came out in 2019, and it was a great. I just felt a um, great cinematic experience too. It was just a very earnest film. <laughs> uh, no no kind of like sleight of hand no just very like you know we're with this character you know uh you feel for this character you know for edward norton's character without and you could argue as a bit of a self-insert like well okay well maybe maybe yes but at the same time like you can kind of forgive him for because it's like written so well and jonathan Lethem i think did the book so um i've heard, heard good things so uh soundtrack by tom york and flea i believe did the played bass it's just phenomenal just like you know daily battles like daily battles we are to do a daily something like that just very like very like barren just a you know kind of a piano and the you know like kind of an upright bass i think kind of a kind of a, um stealing you know uh, reminding me of redolent of that classical jazz um well not classic maybe jazz but like um jazz standards or the kind of the lounge era of you know like soft piano keys and chet baker on you know trumpet playing that's kind of thing um almost blue that's just the you know even though El elvis costello wrote that song it's kind of it has like a almost at least chet baker's iteration of it was very jazzy um you know and there's other things like um oh you fell in love you know like that's another one. anyway so i'm talking about music more than i'm talking about movies i don't know why um 
There's also another movie came out in 1997 called Life is Beautiful by this Italian director um, who I will, who also acted in it. Oh, find out his name now. Oh, it's directed by Roberto Benigni, who also starred in it as the lead role as it's been some years because Guido, Guido is this very kind of witty guy who uses his wit and his ability to think on his feet and to like improvise. Um, he uses that to his own advantage, but not in a sleazy way, not in like a, ooh, like to, he uses it, um, all the, I mean, his character's not like a perfect saint, but, um, he is earnest too. I'm sorry, I keep using that word, but it's, it's so all encompassing, but he is, uh, you know, he uses it for like sincere goals, you know, he's basically, the gist of it is that, um, I remember growing up with this movie in the periphery, always seeing scenes of it, but never understanding it, because I think, um, I was just too young to understand too, because it was like a, you know, it is a Holocaust-focused movie, and I was expecting to go into it when I did watch it for reals, uh, only a few years back, I think. Um, I think like when I was expecting it to be like very morbid and depressing, Schindler's List kind of thing, walking into it and be like, is this going to be a Schindler's List type of deal? Am I going to be in tears? <laughs> um, but no, it wasn't. It wasn't. Although it did get sad. Spoiler alert. Um, towards the end, definitely it did. There was a moment, but like I felt like his sadness wasn't, you know, like that. I felt like, um, I will get to that in a second. But um, you know, basically, Guido's, you know, it kind of follows his life a little bit before the war. Um, I think he's, you know, trying to win the affection of like a girl, and he's like trying to, and he, you know, he's he has a way of like kind of, um, getting by. Um, as a waiter and he's like kind of he has a way of kind of like um you know thinking quick on his feet and kind of like earning a living by kind of you know if like maybe if waiting doesn't work out he'll try you know like uh you know convincing or you know th you know th uh, cajoling people into kind of getting getting keeping him on the crew and like he's he's able to kind of survive by doing that like that's his you know that's his way is you know of subsisting uh, is by doing that, uh, even though he's like on it, on, it's weird because he's doing these jobs that are like, don't really require him to be like comedic and, but he's using those skills for like, you know, to read people and do like, he's using that, um, in order to keep those jobs, I think. Um, so, but yeah, he, uh, then he falls in love with this girl, you know, the classic this girl and then he, they have a son and um the son's name is um Guizzi, I think. Um and they basically you know, the, the everything just falls to pieces when the war starts, obviously. World War Two. Um and this takes place in Italy, so it's obviously Nazi occupied Italy. Um I'm rushing my World War Two history, but basically, you know, when it must have been early forties, forty one, forty two I guess. And um, I'm not sure to what extent they. I know they really Poland, like with you know the Warsaw Pact and all that, and how it was especially drastic for them and Jewish groups, especially within them. But I think with this, it was um, I think it, you know I'm, I'm sure there was like also devastating effects for the Jewish uh, diaspora of like Italy as well. So uh, I guess nobody was spared in that sense, and you know basically with the uh, uh, what happens with Guido and his family is they're um, put in an internment camp, and um, I'm not sure how much of this is historically accurate, but like the movie does, you know, it's obviously dramatized. It's the movie um, Creative Liberties, so, but you know, they're put in a, a camp, and one scene that I really love is like when they're first put in the camp, and uh, the Nazi uh, guard is like in German saying, like, it's like you will be given such and such to rations per day you will be given like you will uh not be able to see your friends you'll be confined to these rooms and you'll to put work camps so you'll be defended to horrible work camps to work 12 hours a day and then uh guido starts like translating for his son uh you know his like their group well in italian for especially for his son in you know in 
in mind, but like for the rest of the group, he's saying, uh, uh, in his native language, he's like, you will be given uh, nice, uh, cozy blankets, and a, you'll be given. Well, then we're we're gonna go around. We're gonna give everybody cookies and snacks, and it's gonna be. This isn't verbatim what he said, but it's just like it's gonna go around, and and I, you know, I give everyone one hug, and you know, it's like we'll uh, we'll all be you know playing games and you know throwing balls and uh, you know having fun. And it's just like he uh, thinks on his feet in in a, in a way that's he he's able to kind of salvage it and not make everything so devastating for his son because um, he loves him so much and he's doing it out of an er a sincere expression of love and that's why this movie is like so because he's not he's not doing it for selfish gain but he's like making sure he he he's sacrificial in that uh, in the way he's using his talents and I, that's what I love about this movie um, yeah in, in, in the sad in the ending of why it's so sad is that, and not at the same time and conflicted because he died um doing you know saving his son knowing his you know he died and they didn't dwell on it they didn't so they didn't show it um which is why it's almost like it's weird that seeing this as a kid uh, um it's something that almost like you could watch as a kid and understand but at the same time i don't remember if i saw it in full and quite understood it or if i see if i even saw it in the first place but i do remember um uh, you know, like when I first watched it, at least being, uh, being like, you know, like his death was, it wasn't, it was, it was always in the cards, unfortunately, with this house, this high the stakes were. But when Guido died, it was like still sad. Like, you're just like, gosh. And so, because like he wanted him to just like be reunited with his son and just like have the benefit. But like when he, you know, that his death was also, you know, it wasn't meaningless. It was like, you know, it was, you know, for the greater good of his son, you know, so. Anyway, so that's kind of one of his uh, movies that you don't want to watch all too much. You know, kind of want to savor them, but. Um, there's some of the Lynn Ramsey stuff, too. She does, like, a lot of kind of horror, not, oh, sorry, psychological kind of thick movies. Very, <laughs> um, hard to watch, too, um. Like, uh, we need to talk. We need. We need to talk about Kevin. Uh, it was probably more off the top of my head. Um, I think it came out twenty eleven. So, um, quite a um, interesting kind of thing going on with it because it's you know Tilda Swinton's probably one of my favorite actresses, um, and she does a really good job of kind of playing this distraught, but also flawed mother like you feel you feel it goes into the kind of the psychology of um oddly enough as ezra miller is um plays in this role and there's like a lot of kind of weird undertones kind of like what's happening with him now and like how kind of far gone he's gone today and i'm not gonna get the weeds on that but um just figured people have pointed it out too like how strange it is that you know it's like it's a story about a school um shooter and just but like it's it's also so, because these one I haven't seen the movie since I've first seen it uh, some years back, so it's and I'm not sure if I want to kind of and that's not a dig against the movie it's just kind of like with come and see where like I kind of want to save that for like once every like almost like four or five six years kind of um, just because of how harrowing and how distressing it can be because like it's hard for me um i'm a sort of person sometimes where i easily kind of like pick up on certain things and i'll start aping or emulating certain aspects of the movies that i watch whether i think about it or not so I'll, like kind of like if i watch the tv show mind hunter i'll be like i'll be kind of like in a true crime kind of criminal psychology kind of mode <laughs> and i'll be like i wonder what it, being an fbi agent would be like and i'll start thinking about that but also probably gets an honorable mention too mind hunter really great all three seasons too was there all three seasons i think there's two seasons two seasons um i don't know if netflix to their shame they should be shamed <laughs> for not picking up on another one um asap because somehow 
something like I can't remember the name of it. Um, these other crappy kind of CW esque kind of teen sh dramas get millions of seasons. But anyway, so yeah, Lynn Ramsey. Yeah, we need to talk. Kevin was like, so um, 